Good afternoon and welcome to the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service here at the UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. My name is John Graby and I direct the Rudman Center. The Rudman Center provides curricular, uh, experiential, and financial support for law students who are interested in public interest careers. And it also serves as a face of the university here in Concord by presenting public programming, such as today's event, that aligns with its mission. We are so happy uh, to be able to partner with the ACLU of New Hampshire on this ongoing series, uh, Civil Liberties and the Presidency. Today, we are happy to welcome to the law school Senator Cory Booker from the state of New Hampshire, uh, from the state of New Jersey, not New Hampshire. <laughs> Senator, Booker ha Senator Booker has been a senator since 2013. Uh, before that, he was the mayor of Newark, New Jersey from 2006 to 2013. And prior to that, he actually served on the Municipal Council in Newark. He is a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he's a graduate of Stanford University and Yale Law School. Moderating today's event will be Jeannie Ruska from the ACLU of New Hampshire. Neither the ACLU of New Hampshire nor the uh, Rudman Center uh, is a, we are both nonpartisan organizations and neither endorses political candidates. So with that, please welcome Senator Cory Booker. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right, sit down for crying out loud. <laughs> so um, they've already told me I'm chained. Do not go beyond the boundaries of the ACLU sign. So um, I, I may, I may, I'm a former football player. Whenever I stay stationary, I think some linebacker might hit me. Um, I, I want to jump in and just give some short indirect remarks, and then I really want to get into the conversation. But uh, understand that I am here because uh, literally, uh, Americans were willing to stand up and fight for the rights of people that didn't necessarily look like them or pray like them or even were in the same geography. Fifty years ago, in fact, it was a group of activists in a small town in New Jersey that made this determination that black families were trying to move into northern New Jersey suburbs looking for the best public schools and they said that they were going to stand up and fight for them. And they formed this group that would do sting operations in New Jersey and they would go and follow black families around when the black family was turned away from housing, that white couple volunteering would come up and, and say, hey, uh, we'd like to buy this house. And one of those families was mine. Uh, I was two months old, 1969, and my parents were denied to move into the house I grew up in. And it was activists that showed up and helped my family buy a home that they were originally denied. Now, what's amazing about the story is the white couple put a bid on the house, the bid was accepted, papers were drawn up, and on the day of the closing in the real estate agent's office, the white couple did not show up. My dad did, and a volunteer lawyer from that group of activists. And they walked into the real estate agent's office, confronted the real estate agent, who then didn't give up. He stands up and punches my dad's lawyer in the face and sigs a dog on my dad. And I tell you, as I was growing up in this beautiful town, uh, uh, in this great neighborhood, every time my dad would tell this story, the dog would get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> my family is, has values that your families probably share. I, I go off to Stanford University, don't get impressed. I got in because of a 4.0, 1600, 4.0 yards per carry, 1600 receiving yards. <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, but I was earnest. I, 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 I stayed and got my master's, went overseas, studied at Oxford, came back and went to Yale Law School. But my parents, that wasn't their measure of success. My dad's like, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. <laughs> Life is not about the degrees you get, it's about the service you give. So running legal clinics at Yale, I decided that my life was going to be about trying to pay back <laughs> all the blessings I inherited from activists who were willing to stand on the front lines, take punches, be beaten, People that were willing to stand together for my rights. As my father would remind me, you drink deeply from wells of freedom, liberty, and opportunity that you didn't dig. So my first job coming out of law school was to, I decided to move into one of America's most lowest income neighborhoods where we don't mistake wealth with worth. And I became a tenant's rights lawyer because people fought for my housing rights. I couldn't pay it back. I had to pay it forward. My whole career began in a low income inner city community fighting for the issues and the unfinished business of America. 
And I have stayed. I'm the only United States senator. I am the only person running for this office that still lives in a black and brown community below the poverty line. And I'm telling you, we have fought and made tremendous changes. We've made changes in our community. You walk around my block. I try to get reporters to do it with me all the time. You see uh, uh, black businesses that have opened, entrepreneurs that are successful, schools that are now outperforming the suburbs, supermarkets and food deserts. Tens of thousands of jobs in our cities being created, fighting against gentrification by doubling the production of affordable housing, making sure everybody has a community to live in. We were able to transform Newark and outcomes that people thought weren't possible. The lowest performing urban district in our, in our state, now the number one school system in America for beat the odd schools, kids in poverty going on to college. So many changes that when I got down to the Senate, I, I knew what it took to make changes. It's the same thing that's always made change. In fact, it's how we made change in Newark when I first started taking on slumlords. It's by bringing people together, to stand together, to work together, to understand that we are all caught, as King says, in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As a black guy going down to the Senate, the fourth ever elected in our country, I wanted to be a voice of lived experiences of the unfinished business and started taking on the big fights that were devastating communities across this country and communities in my hometown of Newark. And, and those are things like criminal justice reform. The only major bipartisan bill to pass under this president is the one that I helped write and led from the Democratic side in the Senate that has led to the liberation of thousands of people from prison. And even things I didn't get passed, the bill that I wrote about the dignity of women in prison, well, that legislation is so strong that now it's been picked up by at least 10 states and passed on the state level. I have one driving concern of my entire life. It's that this nation live up to its promise to all of its people. We pledge allegiance and say that we'll be a nation of liberty and justice for all, but that isn't the case. These words are still aspirational. That's why I'm excited to be here today. I'm gonna to take my seat, but I wanna make one interesting point to you. Change does not come from Washington, it comes to Washington. It wasn't a bunch of men in 1920 on the Senate floor that said, hey, fellas, let's give women the right to vote. Okay, yeah, break. No. <laughs> we didn't get civil rights because Strom Thurmond, longest filibuster in, in, in Senate history, one day came to the Senate floor and said, I've seen the light. Let those Negro people have some rights. No, it always comes because folks like you are willing to stand up and fight for it. Why did that lawyer in the 1960s represent black families. Well, he says one night he was sitting at home watching TV, March 7th, 1964, watching TV, the movie most Americans were watching that night was Judgment at Nuremberg. And this historic night in America, they broke away from an ongoing movie to show a bridge in Alabama called the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where civil rights marchers were marching from Selma to Montgomery. They get stopped on that bridge by Alabama state troopers that would not let them pass. And then this guy on a couch in New Jersey, this white man on a couch in New Jersey, sees them get viciously beating, we, beaten. We know that day is Bloody Sunday. I talked to John Lewis's chief of staff today. He was on that bridge. And what did one guy on a couch in New Jersey do? Did he just sit there and be a spectator, treat our democracy like a spectator sport? No. He said he got up off the couch, thought he was going to go to Alabama, but then realized he couldn't afford a ticket. So he decides to do this great American tradition. I'm going to do the best I can with what I have where I am. He phoned around to see in 1965 who might need some legal support in New Jersey, found a group of activists meeting in the living room. They put together a sting operation. Four years pass, he says, and he gets his case file of a family coming up from the South, distressed because they can't find housing in northern New Jersey. They're being turned away. And he said, we represented that family and got them in. Corey, do you know the two names on that case file? I go, no, sir. He goes, it was Carrie and Carolyn Booker, your parents. I am literally sitting here right now because of civil rights activists that I know, but I'm also sitting here right now because a white guy in Jersey, middle class, living comfortably, knew that his freedoms are intrinsically tied to the freedoms of others in America. Because he stood up, I'm a United States Senator right now, because he stood up, I'm running to be President of the United States. I could literally be the first descendant of slaves in our country to go to the White House, which was built by slaves. All of these things are possible not because of who the president was or who senators were, it's because of the activism and the engagement of citizenry of this country, of people who understand that patriotism is love of country, but you cannot love your country unless you love your fellow countrymen and women. And love isn't anemic, love is not 
sentimentality. Love is sacrifice, love is service. As one great activist once said, what does love look like in public? It looks like justice. Thank you for being here today to have a conversation about justice. Thank you for that, Senator. So we're gonna get started with Q and A's, a combination of me taking the privilege of asking questions and questions from the audience. Um, but I wanna start with a question that really pulls from the themes that you just echoed, which are criminal justice reform and race. We have an inherently unjust criminal system in this country where too often your experience with that system is based on the color of your skin and your income level, as opposed to what you've done. So you've committed to extensive criminal justice reform, and I wanted to give you a chance to kind of lay out what your top reforms would be as president. So look, anybody who's running for president needs to have earned trust. We all have long experiences. This issue that you're bringing up, criminal justice reform, is not an issue or not a tab on my website. It's been my life effort. I started in law school when the 1994 crime bill passed. I was in law school and knew that it was gonna lead to the in fact, between the time I was in law school and the time I was mayor of the city of Newark, this nation was building a new prisoner jail every 10 days. And, and this isn't just racial disparities in incarceration. As Michelle Alexander says in her book, this is the new Jim Crow. It has literally devastated American communities. Uh, Villanova, I think, is a school that did a study that showed that we'd have 20% less poverty in all of America if our, if our incarceration rates were the same as our industrial peers. And what's so offensive, and it should offend all of us, is I went to college and saw lots of people using drugs. I know not here at this uh, law school, but the, I, I mean, you, you literally saw it. But there is a different standard for different people, as was said. There's no difference in America between blacks, whites, Latinos for using drugs, even dealing drugs. But if you're black in America, you're almost four times more likely to be incarcerated for that. And for people who think that, oh, we don't incarcerate people for marijuana usage anymore. In 2017, there were more marijuana arrests than all violent crimes combined. And when you get arrested for one of these things, it's a lifetime sentence. Because you may not serve any jail time, but now you can't get a job, a loan from the bank. You can't get many housing opportunities. Your life is changed. Your economic outcomes change. If you have children, their lives are changed forever. We now have more African Americans because of mass incarceration. We have now have more African Americans under criminal supervision in this country than all the slaves in 1850. And, and so you, you, before I talk to you, what I'm gonna do as president, this is, and, and, and we have, we, in my career, on every level of my career, we've thought, thought to bring in reforms and make big changes. And so, as President of the United States, let me tell you, I, this is not a side issue for me. Ending mass incarceration, it's a cancer on the soul of our nation. And I will do everything in my power to tear down this system of mass incarceration, to end racial disparities, not just in incarceration, but even all the things that lead to incarceration. Most Americans don't know that we have systems of suspension in our schools, out of school suspension, that for the same exact infractions, African American boys and girls are so much more likely to have out of school suspensions, which are directly correlated with challenges with police. We have a system that is it, the racial disparities from environmental injustice to, to housing injustices, racial disparities in housing that all lead to a criminal justice system, all lead to massive disparities. It has to stop. My career has been based upon it. The legislation, more, more than a dozen pieces of legislation I've been pushing and moving as a United States Senator speak to that. And when I am President of the United States, I want to be the, uh, the, the President. We've seen other Presidents line up with new visions of tough on crime, hiring police off, all the kind of stuff that over-incarcerated our country, I'm gonna be the president. One of the legacies of my presidency uh, will be ending mass incarceration and turning ourselves not to a punitive justice system, but a restorative justice system. I'm gonna press you on a couple specifics please, here. Please. So let's start with a list. Legalizing cannabis. Uh, the number one bill in the Senate is uh, something called the uh, Marijuana Justice Act, comprehensive bill. I wrote it and I let lead it, and please do not talk about legalizing marijuana if not in the same paragraph you don't talk about expunging people's records uh, who've been past incarcerated. Um, and so my bill, I, I'm a guy who's never drank alcohol for crying out loud. I, my bill, yeah, it involves legal, descheduling, de let's be very specific, I'm in a law school, let's be very specific, deschedulizing uh, marijuana, but it also calls for a number of other things. 
expunging records. It calls for holding states accountable for disparities in marijuana enforcement. Uh, so it has a carrot and a stick to change state laws. Uh, I, I believe fundamentally that the states that are legalizing marijuana uh, shouldn't then exclude people from getting contracts to be sellers. Overwhelmingly, this is an industry now that is white. And, and a lot of the folks who are convicted for doing things that two of the last three presidents admitted to doing can't even get those business opportunities. That's why I call it the marijuana justice bill, because it's a lot bigger than just legalizing cannabis. So one more on this. Many of the people who are incarcerated in this country are incarcerated in state prisons and state jails, yes. right? So there's a question of how much can the president actually do to end mass incarceration. And in a lot of this is how do you incentivize states to take action? Um, so I know you believe very much that substance use disorders are a medical issue and should be treated medically rather than through cages and incarceration. How do you incentivize states to adopt that same philosophy? Yeah, well, this, um, I, and most folks here know that one of the things that drove mass incarceration were federal policies that literally incentivized states to change their mandatory minimums, to put in three strikes laws, gave them the money they needed to build more prisons. So we incentivized the system from the federal level, making massive amounts of dollars available to, to, to states that were changing their criminal justice systems and, and locking people up. As a local leader, I was a mayor of a city and entered the complicated challenges. Um, we, we, we know that, that there are streams of funding. Thank you. <laughs> so grateful. <laughs> the one, the casualty of this campaign for me is always my voice. Uh, um, so now I can talk in a more room, my inside voice. Um, there are streams of income that we can now say and withhold from states that are not doing productive things. In addition to that, my Justice Department I, I view my Justice Department and my Civil Rights Division and my education, Department of Education, uh, I, I'm going to view them the same way that Johnson administration, Kennedy administration did, for far more activists in making sure the ideals of our country. So if you have racial disparities in incarceration, there are fundamental uh, uh, problems uh, with that. And, and, and the federal government can do things. In the same way the Obama administration, and I was a city, they did this, use your Justice Department to investigate disparities in policing. Newark, New Jersey, and I was a black mayor of a black city, and we didn't know until the Justice Department came in, did data analyses that we frankly couldn't have afford, even afforded to do, and showed us that we had massive disparities in the stops we were doing on black and brown people. And, and so my, the, in the same way the Obama administration was leaning into accountability and policing, rightfully so, and helped cities like me do a much better job, uh, we've got to start leaning in on disparities in incarceration, disparities within suspensions in education, disparities of the treatment of LGBTQ Americans, because there are many states that have savage inequalities based upon race, uh, uh, orientation, uh, and even religion that have to be addressed. We'll go to the audience. Hello, Jersey in the house. I grew up in Milburn. Jersey first, New Hampshire next. <laughs> so um, uh, on a much more uh, serious nature, the current administration seems to be doing everything it can to be driving wedges between all of the minority communities in our country, whether they're Jewish communities, black communities, brown communities, Hispanic communities, Southeast Asian communities, Muslim communities. Um, and as we're seeing, there's a huge increase in hate crimes across our country including ones just last week um, you know, at a rabbi's home during the celebration of Hanukkah, which is a, a celebration, for those of you who don't know, about a time when oppressed people fought back and won. Um, and so I guess I'm curious, what do you see as some of the strategies we can do to reunite ourselves? I guess there are lessons from the most recent Star Wars movie that people are afraid to speak up when they think they're on their own, but when they realize that when we pull together, we can overcome, that that's the most critical part. Um, so first of all, anybody from Jersey who's quoting Star Trek, uh, Star Wars, God bless you, um, <laughs> as a sci-fi uh, fanatic. Um, so this is one of the things that's making fear, one of the things that's making fear inject our society. We've become so much more of a fear-based culture because of a president from his immigration policies, which is striking fear into immigrant communities, all the way to his failure to being able to even condemn Nazis. And we are seeing a rise in violence. Since 9-11, there have been more terrorist attacks driven by right-wing extremists, and the majority of those have been right, uh, white supremacists. And so one thing that first and foremost, if I'm President of the United States, I'm Commander-in-Chief, and Martin Luther King said, I can't legislate you to love me, 
but I can pass laws to stop you from lynching me. Uh, I, I can't pass laws to, uh, 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 to, to change your heart, but I can pass laws to restrain the heartless. We need to be doing a lot more to number one, naming and acknowledging white supremacy, uh, uh, naming and acknowledging anti-Semitic violence, naming and acknowledging anti-Islamic violence, and then doing the things necessary to investigate it, to thwart it before it happens, uh, and to better uh, do the kind of things that we know, the kind of research that we know, that can diffuse these things before they rise up into violent acts. And so that's number one. But number two is, it's the energy that you're putting out from the Oval Office. And, and, and this is a, a president right now that's using their platforms as you said, to divide this nation against itself, to try to pit Americans against Americans. And let me tell you right now, and you may not want this flavor as a president, but if you do, I hope you'll support me because so much of my campaign is about policy issues, but it's about the, the thrust of my campaign is creating the conditions necessary to make those policy changes actually possible. And this means to stop hate in this country where we, those of you from the holidays, can't even sit down now with family members because of the tribalism in our country. The 60 million people who voted for Donald Trump are not our enemy. I, I'm a guy that wants to beat Donald Trump, put Mitch McConnell back into the back benches, and I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that happens. But it doesn't happen by being like the very people that we are trying to get out of office. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm running for a town hall in, in Iowa, about to jump on the stage, big lumbering over, I'm a big guy, I don't know if you all know this, this former All-American football player, former tight end for Stanford, the older I get, the better I was. And, and, and big guy stops me, puts his arm around me and goes, dude, I want you to punch Donald Trump in the face. And I look at him and I go, dude, that's a felony. <laughs> and, and black guys, we don't get away with that that much. <laughs> and, and, so, and so look, we didn't beat Bull Connor because we brought bigger dogs and bigger fire hoses. We, we beat him because artists of activism called to the best of who we are, inspired people to get off the side. In fact, in Birmingham, when King wrote the letters in the Birmingham jail, he didn't write them to deplore the hate mongers of our country who will always be in the minority. He called to the good people who were doing nothing. And, and this is the challenge right now in our politics. We think the end is to beat each other. Well, I'm a Democrat that's gonna tell you right now, the end goal for me is not beating Republicans, it's uniting Americans in common cause and common purpose. And that brings me to the last. I'm gonna use my platforms every day to heal, to inspire a, a more courageous empathy, to, 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 to ignite a, a revival of civic grace. These are all things that are critically important. But you said one thing, though, that I want to be very clear. Anti-Semitism is on a massive rise. The Muncie stabbing attacks were anti-Semitic. We need to call it and name it. But there is also something. It wasn't either or. It was both of these two things. We in this nation, one of the shames of our country is how we treat Americans with serious mental illness. We, we, we now, the biggest institutions that are housing people with mental illness are our prisons and our jails. And people with mental illness are coming in and out of our prisons and jails, never getting the support they need. And by the way, they should never be going there in the first place. And so if you look, if you drill down on the Muncie attacks, here's a person that showed so many signs of crisis, of serious mental illness, schizophrenia, but we don't have a society to affirm the dignity of all people and try to treat people that have these medical conditions. That is a civil rights issue. It's a human rights issue. The shamefulness of a society that takes people with mental illness and puts them into conditions that make their mental illness worse. This is why the last thing I fought to get in that criminal justice bill was a ban on juvenile solitary confinement in the United States. Because psychological professionals in our country without call that a human rights violation, and it does. It is proven it triggers mental illness or causes mental illness. That you're much more likely to commit suicide as a child when that happens. And so it, under my presidency, this is what I mean. The call of a president is to use your constitutional duties, but the other call in the highest office in the land is to use that platform to inspire that grace and that empathy to create the necessary preconditions that call good people back into the field to keep the fight going to affirm the dignity and the humanity of all people. So I want to build on that with an interesting issue, and that's surveillance. Because one of the concerns that's come up is with the rise of white nationalism, there's a desire for increased domestic surveillance. And as a civil liberties organization, surveillance is deeply troubling to us um, because any surveillance that can be used on 
a terrorist organization can be used against local protesters. So how do you balance this? How do you balance this pursuit of, of fighting hate crimes while also preserving personal privacy and making sure that surveillance is not misused by the government? Well, I, I'm actually a guy, and I hope people will watch the movie Street Fight. If you don't think love is the most powerful force, uh, I hope you will watch the, the movie about how I beat a political machine in Newark. It was nominated for an Oscar, unfortunately lost in the Oscars to a movie called March of the Dagnab Penguins. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but as was said in that movie, I literally, by the police, had my phones tapped. I was a political opponent. This might remind you of something that went on in the White House recently, where somebody was, I believe, somebody was using their power uh, to violate uh, fundamental rights. And this is a tough balance. We went way away from this. Remember, after 9-11, fear is a toxic thing, and people were willing to surrender basic American freedoms in the name of security. Well, when you do that, you lose both. You lose your freedoms, and you lose your security. And, and as a guy that actually had to run stuff, this is a thorny issue. So when I decided to put cameras all around Newark in public spaces, the ACLU of Newark complained. And I said, I don't know if we're going to agree on it, but we brought them to the table to literally write with us the standard operating procedures of what we could do and couldn't do with those cameras. We've got to find a balance with this, but there's got to be far better accountability in the federal government than we see right now. A, a lot of people think that, again, again, in this context of Trump, there are a lot of points that are being made. The FBI recently, uh, their, their Inspector General report brought out a lot of very bad practices FISA courts, I can go through all the things right now that disturb me deeply. I go further than this. Privacy on the internet and, and of these devices that we carry around hold our most intimate information. Who can get into that and who can't? So if you are not every day wrestling with these thorny issues, then, then problems are going to happen. And my commitment to you as someone who has been the subject of, of the abuse of this kind of power is to find a way to strike that balance. And one of the ways to do this is to invite civil rights organizations to the table to help craft these policies and find that correct balance. So speaking of tech, which is what you just mentioned, um, you support third party privacy, right? Which is information held by a third party like Facebook, Google, um, Amazon. And one of the issues that comes up here is how do you prevent companies from sharing data because we had a third party privacy bill here in New Hampshire and had DC lobbyists coming up to fight it because tech companies earn their money off of private information. So how here's the other balance, right? How do you strike the balance between supporting private business and also preserving personal privacy? So we are way out of whack right now. Corporations are winning in ways that should just frankly outrage Americans. I lost in this vote in the Senate with other Democrats when cable companies, who we're paying, <laughs> came, to, came to the United States government and said, we want to be able to take your viewing data now and sell that. I'm already paying you, and now you're going to actually take my viewing data and see how much sci-fi I actually watch? Uh, um, um, this is outrageous. Corporate power in this country is corrupting our values and our individual rights. I don't know if we'll agree on this or not, but I think campaign finance laws in this country are violating our First Amendment rights. Because when you say a corporation is a human, <laughs> and they can now pump ungodly amounts of money into our, our, to our politics, I believe that suppresses my First Amendment rights as a guy who's not a billionaire. And, and so these are balances that we now have. But I'm one of these people calling for regulations of these uh, tech platforms, which I believe are, are violating privacy, violating national security, we can go into that as well, and that we need to rebalance this to give individuals better control over your private data. Back to questions. And I just want to acknowledge, you had your hand up there first. <laughs> because I'm eager to talk about a hate crime that has been bothering me for many years, on 24 May 1979, the governor of New Hampshire signed a bill to raise the drinking age, and I suddenly found myself no longer old enough. Uh, they felt that I should be punished for crimes other people were doing, just the same as if you were going to go to jail for a crime committed by somebody else named Cory Booker. Uh, I, it's amazing that some people think it's terrible if the president withheld foreign aid uh, as a way to pressure President Zelensky into doing something. 
but it's perfectly okay for Congress, that's you, uh, to withhold highway construction money as a way to pressure state legislators and governors into committing a hate crime against people under 21. That it's terrible if the owner of a private catering company is free to refuse to serve at a same-sex so-called wedding, but it's perfectly okay to deploy gun-toting goons in bulletproof vests to intimidate the same caterer into refusing to serve alcoholic drinks to Mr. and Mrs. Twenty. So I, I want to really talk about the substance of what you talked about, but I, I think we run into a, a, some problems in this country when we equate things to hate crimes that, that, uh, t that look, I, I, I live in New Jersey and we just had a horrible uh, shooting attack on uh, Orthodox Jews in Jersey City. Uh, a person motivated, and you see their manifestos and the things they've written uh, by hatred. Um, and, and we gotta be very careful because these are now legal distinctions. And, and I think when we start throwing around these terms, sometimes we dilute the sense of urgency uh, and even the me mechanisms with which to deal with actual hate crimes. So, so I just want to say that as a stipulate that. The, the second thing about federal government doing things to drive down drinking ages, and, and, and again, we have a very des specially designed republic to affirm states' rights, and I think that's really what you're getting to, is where is the balance on these things? And sir, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I, I have never thought about drinking age as a policy issue. It's never been on my, on my, on my, uh, on my, uh, on my sort of agenda. And I, I'm open to learning more. I don't know the history you talked about. Uh, in 1979, I, I was a nine-year-old boy trying to uh, uh, figure out how big I can grow my afro. Um, <laughs> And so, and so I'll, I'll look at these issues and everything like that, but I do worry about that balance. And, and as an African American in this country, I'm uniquely aware that people continue to try to suppress states, uh, uh, the rights of minorities in this country under the guise of states' rights. And, and we had that battle in the 60s where states were trying to do things. We have that battle right now on voting rights in this country where, where all these states feel like it's their prerogative to write voting laws that are suppressing, as they said in North Carolina, the voting laws were narrowly tailored, federal judge said this, narrowly tailored to disenfranchise African American voters. And so again, I've said this, you know my bias right now, I respect states' rights, but if you are violating the rights of transgender Americans, violating the voting rights of all Americans, if you are targeting minorities in your state in ways that I believe violate federal law, uh, my Justice Department will uphold the law. I will not do what this administration is doing, is pulling back all civil rights protections uh, um, from affected uh, uh, groups um, and really allowing free reign for states to do things that are violative of what I think are basic American principles established by the Bill of Rights. You mentioned an issue that is actually very pertinent in New Hampshire right now. I know what my cue is. I <laughs> um, so, yeah, my name is Polana. Um, so I I joined a friend today at the DMV as uh, for for those of you that don't know. Yesterday at the DMV, New Hampshire officially started offering non-binary driver's licenses. Yeah, uh, it's it's super. Oh, oh. I was pointing to Senator Waters, who was a uh, co-sponsor. Okay. That's what's Um, yeah, so I went with them, and it was just like sheer joy as they got this X. And we went out to breakfast afterwards, and they were like, they were like, now I want one on my uh, passport, but that's not an option. So I'm just curious, you know, like if you were to be elected, would you support non-binary identities in legal documentation? I mean, you want to answer Jeff? Yeah. And, and I want to say something why again. Um, one of the early books I had this mother who was. Uh, <laughs> I still remember when Roots was coming out, getting back to the 70s, and, and my mom was one of these mothers that I used to just get upset about when I was a child, but now I'm like, she's a superhero to me. She's like, well, before we watch Roots, we will read the book. <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, one of the early books I wrote was one called The Invisible Man. And, and when we as a culture render people into invisibility, 
Um, you're rendering them to a space where rights are violated, where oppression is heaped upon them. When you bring people to the, back to the center of affirming their dignity, their identity, you, you begin to move towards justice far more. And so this is not an issue of yeah, convenience. Like, no, this is a, a fundamental issue of, of justice. And, and, and so I want to go one step further. Because um, when I was mayor of the city of Newark, I am a guy that believes, and again, John Lewis I'm talking about a lot, he has this idea of like good trouble. And I knew that this was gonna cause good trouble because it was 2006 and the Democratic Party leaders had not yet evolved on LGBTQ issues. And they were opposed to, um, to marriage equality. But even more than that, they passed awful legislation like the Defense of Marriage Act. And so I'm being one of these, there was another mayor in California named Gavin Newsom, who I love to death, he's a dear friend of mine, that we were trying to cause a lot of trouble on the mayoral level. So I became mayor, raised the American flag, and then the next flag I raised in front of City Hall was the pride flag. Well, I got thunderous hate calls to City Hall, with people, not anonymous hate calls, people telling me who they were and why they would never support me again. And then I got more cantankerous, and I just said, okay, well, I'm a mayor, we have the power to marry people, I will not marry anyone, uh, until everybody can get married. And then my mom calls me up. She's the first angry call and says, Corey, you're single. Please marry one person. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I just want to say that a lot of times this is a victory, and I'm proud of what you all have done here. Marriage is a victory. I'm proud of that. But what should have everybody upset and gets me very emotional is the sheer physical danger of being gay in America, of being transgender in America. We just finished a year where 19 black transgender women were murdered because of who they were. We still live in a nation where 30% of LGBTQ children report not going to school because of fear. The violence in this country, the, the bullying, the intimidation, the firings, because in the majority of states in America, you can be fired, you can post your wedding pictures on, online, but you can be fired from your job with no legal recourse whatsoever. The reason why, like the, the, my, some of the folks over here, that I'm a original co-sponsor, led the legislation for the Equality Act, is just as a demonstration that we have so much further to go in order to become a country where the rights of LGBTQ Americans are the same as the rights of mine. And so I celebrate these victories, but I do not want to in any way get people this, to have any sense of understanding that we still don't live in a world where every single day people take their lives into their own hands by just walking down streets holding hands with somebody that they love. So that was an incredible legislative victory this year um, and we're heading into a legislative session next week um, and we're actually facing legislation that is targeting trans student athletes. And this is legislation that we've seen in other states that would essentially result in full body cavity searches of, of young students. Um, it's abhorrent, and it's obviously not coming from within New Hampshire. This is coming from outside. Um, so on that, you mentioned on day one, I will begin restoring justice to trans Americans. Um, and I'm interested in how you combat this narrative where it's not just about legal issues, it's about building a culture that is inclusive. Um, because we've been here before, right? We're here with every time there's a minority that the culture picks on, we're back to the fight over whether they should participate equally in sports and schools and whatever it is. Um, so how do you fight that? So look, again, so my, my job when I was mayor was not just to execute what the municipal charter, the rules they give me. The Constitution is wonderful things. I will abide by the Constitution, and I will do my job as a constitutional officer, your president. But I knew as mayor that part of my job was expanding the moral imagination of the whole country, because the country looked down on urban places like my city. And, and my whole career is about this idea, because as a guy who's just a simple shadow of, of the greatness of a guy like John Lewis, John Lewis's brilliances, Ella Baker's brilliances, uh, 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 Susan B. Anthony, uh, 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 I can go through the great activists, Alice Paul, who was this name that everybody should know, this great, the first protest in front of, uh, uh, in front of the White House uh, was a, ever was a suffrage protest of someone who knew how to get the national attention. Alice Paul was then arrested before Gandhi, went on hunger strikes, was, had tubes stuck down her nest and forfeit. These are my heroes. And so my, if, I, if you give me, the, like the people of New Jersey did, the, 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 the honor of representing you as your chief executive, 
I have the other obligation to be, try to hold up to the standards of our previous ancestors who found ways to expand the moral imagination of this country and get more people on to, the, to fighting for the dignity and the honor of all people. When I was, and anybody who's running for president, I wanna know how, what you've done to do that before. When I was mayor of the city of Newark, some, it got national attention. I said, you know what, I'm the mayor of this city. There was a disproportionate high pe number of people who were living on food stamps. And so I did this incredible odyssey of trying to live on food stamps. I am a horrible cook. Uh, um, I, I did not know the, I literally had in my neighborhood, I've always lived in neighborhoods that are below the poverty line, having my neighbors come in and try to have mercy on me to teach me things like, why are you buying canned beans? Buy dry beans, they're cheaper. But literally, I, I found it, I lost so much weight because I was going to bed hungry most every night. But that testimony had to be on national news talking about this absurdity in this country of the amount of money we give to children and families that are struggling. People in my neighborhood who work full-time jobs, catch extra shifts, and in my local bodega still need food stamps. When I was, when I was a city council person, how could people ignore the, the, the clear and present danger of people that live in communities where, where our children are dying every day? And so I went into, uh, into a place called Garden Spire, set up a tent in one of the most dangerous areas, just miles away from some of our most wealthy suburbs, and declared to, them, to the media, I'm going on a hunger strike. I will not eat food until we pay attention to this challenge and do something about it. And so I know that as an executive, as a mayor, I was able to get the country to pay attention to, to invest in, to take part in the, the, the revolutionary changes we were able to make in Newark. But God, make me your president, and I understand my obligations too, to make, to, to bring about the best of who we are. We are good people, we are loving people, but, you, but we have to understand, I, I say this about religion, and I'm one of these people that says, before you tell me about your religion, first show it to me and how you treat other people. <laughs> but but, but there's a, for my faith, there's this ideal that faith without works is dead. We have a civic gospel that we say in our pledges, liberty and justice for all. We're this strange, challenging nation that has one of the greatest, the greatest national anthem. At the end of it, we say home with the brave, but our veterans, our bravest, comes home and they're disproportionately homeless. And so every single day, I'm gonna be doing things. This president, look at his Twitter feed, it's nastiness. It's, he almost has a bravado in his meanness. I'm, I'm one of these guys that's gonna break a lot of norms in your presidency as well but not break them in the way he's doing for demeaning, degrading, and dividing. I'm gonna be breaking norms like I did as a mayor, like I did as a city council person, that, that, to, to try to challenge us to have a, a, a deeper empathy and grace and decency towards each other because that's our legacy, that's our history, and I believe that's gonna be the future of this country, to rise up with that spirit and truly make this a nation that lives up to its greatest words that we say in our songs and pledges. Um, so to live up to that, yeah. We would want to add gender identity to federal non-discrimination protections, um, which means getting it through Congress. And so here's the issue of bipartisanship, right? I mean, I, we could also talk about reproductive rights, issues that are inherently civil rights oriented and have unfortunately become inherently partisan. And so we've had a number of candidates come in and commit to making these very sweeping reforms that they themselves can't achieve because you have to get it through Congress. So with that same issue of emotional courage, how do you achieve bipartisanship on issues that haven't been for quite some time, like trans rights, like reproductive rights? So just two quick points on that. Um, the first is, I, I, this is why if you wanna heal this country, you cannot do it in a partisan way. I'm very serious about this. <laughs> King said uh, that uh, you know, darkness can't drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate can't drive out hate, only love can do that. There, there are people that come up to me and say, I want a, a, a Democratic president that's gonna fight fire with fire. I ran a fire department. It's not a really good strategy, y'all. <laughs> when I got to the Senate, I started on this odyssey of trying to get, have dinner or a meal with every one of my Republican colleagues or go to their office. I, I, I went to dinner with Ted Cruz, it was hard. It was hard to find a restaurant <laughs> because I'm a vegan and he's from Texas, for crying out loud. But he and I passed legislation together to help communities recover after a natural disaster. I go to a Bible study in a right-wing conservative chairman of a committee in Hoff's office, and, and, and I noticed he had a, there was a black girl prominently placed on his, on his shelf. I found that curious. It turns out that she's adopted 
by his, his, grand, his daughter. And, and if I have that right, it might be a son. But my point is, I went to him about this horrible challenges in our education department about not disaggregating data for homeless kids and, and foster children, which means we can't hold people accountable for outcomes. And he got on the bill. We passed it. Criminal justice reform, I had Newt Gingrich in my office, Grover Norquist in my office. I had the Koch brothers general counsel, Mark Holden, in my office. And if I didn't do that, we wouldn't have been able to build the coalitions that pass, pass bills now to get people liberated. So let me be very blunt with you. When it comes to th this party, you want me at the head of the ticket in the next election. Why? Because we've got to ignite the entire rainbow coalition of the Democratic Party. If black folks had turned out at the same levels in 2016 as they turned out in 2012, we'd be talking about President Hillary Clinton right now. In New Jersey, when I'm on the, on the ballot, we saw this in 2013 when I had a special election. Chris Christie didn't want it on his election, moved it three weeks earlier on a Wednesday. African-American turnout spiked between 13 and 14 percent. When it was the next election, normal election, three weeks later on a normal election day in November, people up and down the ticket, but it dropped down between 9 and 10 percent. If you don't have an authentic connection to communities of color as a, as a presidential candidate and can't ignite record turnouts, you want to talk about getting the Senate back? The pathway to get the Senate back goes through North Carolina. When Obama was running, we won that state. We had a Democratic senator. Georgia, two Senate seats up there. Arizona, uh, uh, South Carolina. These are all states where black and brown constituencies are essential to come out to vote. I believe I'm the best person to get us the majority we need in the Senate to do everything that deals with civil liberties, which is not only pass good legislation, but dear God, the person whose health I pray for every single day is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. If you want to make sure we have judges on the, on, the, on the bench. But this gets me back to the point again. And I'm, I'm going to look for a fact checker here. There is one of the most annoying reporters of my life, a guy named Cruz, sitting right there. And I'm going to say this, even though the guy and I have come to big headbutting, the media is not the enemy of the people. <laughs> and, and in fact, they are righteous people, and he's held me accountable my entire political career, you son of a gun. <laughs> um, and, and so he knows the, the wild and wacky things I did as a mayor of the city of Newark to get legislation, things passed that people told me we could not do. And so I become the mayor of the city of Newark in a recession. I become mayor of the city of Newark when people were, were, were literally leaving, flocking out of our city, not people, companies, businesses, unemployment rates spiking. I was running around the country trying to get help. Foundation, heads of foundations, couldn't get them to return my calls. Supermarkets come to my food deserts. I went out to a supermarket chain, and, and the first the chain I, big chain I went to, I'm not exaggerating, they laughed at me when I suggested coming to urban New Jersey, and they explained to me all the reasons why they wouldn't. And I was desperate to find change, and so the, the creativity of your next executive the ability to reimagine things is so important. So as this guy, come up to him and fact check me afterwards. One night on The Tonight Show, the, the, the curtain opens up, the person hosting it then, Conan O'Brien comes on the show, and he insults our city. Like they often do, late night talk show hosts, kicking communities, Detroit jokes, Chicago violence jokes. Well, this guy says, I hear Newark, New Jersey has a new healthcare program. I had done something to lower prescription drug costs for, for parts of my city. And he goes, well, I think the best healthcare program for Newark is a bus ticket out of town. And I'm like, I got you, man. I got you. I went to City Hall the, the, the next day, and I filmed a video of me, some funny things we said, but we got very, I got very fake mad. And I said, Conan O'Brien has insulted the city of Newark. And this is, I'm going to make fun of the civil libertarians in the room, because I said, <laughs> I basically said, Conan O'Brien, you've insulted the city of Newark by the power vested in me by the people of the city of Newark. I hereby ban you from Newark Airport, you're on the no-fly list, try JFK, buddy. <laughs> and I put it up online, and it, the video, he gets millions of people watching the show, but the video goes so viral that I get an avalanche of calls to City Hall, including civil libertarians who did not know it was a joke and were getting on me about violating Conan O'Brien's civil rights, as if we don't have people more pe important people to worry about. Literally, I'm not exaggerating, the TSA took a clarification out on their website that mayors in America don't have the power to ban people <laughs> from their airports. It got such a big story, I'm now getting earned media for Newark that we were never getting before. Everybody who comes, satellite trucks in front of City Hall, I'm doing interviews bragging about the dignity of my city. It became so big that Conan O'Brien goes on his show, you can still pull up videos of this, and he shows my video, gets millions of earned media hits for my city, 
And then he goes, doesn't capitulate, doesn't give up. He bans me from Burbank Airport, <laughs> which for those of you to fly to LA area, not a big deal. LAX is better. It becomes the, one of the biggest stories of that week, this battle between me and Conan, because I go back and ban him from the entire state of New Jersey, of course. And, and then finally, this amazing hero, my, one of my great heroes of life, this person that did so much for human rights on the planet Earth, affirming women's rights or human rights, healing war-torn areas. She was the Secretary of State. Her name was Hillary Clinton. She filmed her own video <laughs> saying basically, in essence, just boiling it all down. It's a funny vi long video. But basically, in essence, she just said, Corey Conan, give peace a chance. <laughs> and next thing you know, the Tonight Show curtain opens up, and, and a mayor of Newark walks onto the stage, is apologized to by Conan O'Brien. He writes about $100,000 worth of uh, uh, charities to, uh, uh, contributions to our charities. But that's not the kicker of the story. The kicker of the story is now I'm more of a national name. I call up a foundations, and they return my call now. Those developers who weren't paying attention to Newark, some of them I got to visit my city, and we got construction we never seen before. The supermarket chain that laughed at me, again, check with crews over there. I shopped there a few weeks ago. This is not a test of who has the best policy plans. I, I'm, I'm serious. Why? Because most of the people on that stage I work with on a daily basis in my day job, and they are brilliant, good people. Democrats attacking Democrats really annoys me because I know the character of most every person running for president, and they are great, righteous people who get up every single day and want to see good done. And by the way, if I'm president, like most of the others, they're going to take the best policy ideas from wherever they can get them and implement them. And I hope they steal from me if I'm not the guy. But this is what we need in our next president. It's not, this is a decision, don't make it just with your head. Make it with your heart and your gut. Who can best ignite the moral imagination of this country? Who can challenge us to deepen the quality of our mercy? Who can call us to the best of our ideals where the best four-letter word can be dropped is not the ones we hear our president using, but is love? That's what my heroes who adorn my walls, that's what they stood for. They called this country out, and people responded. John Lewis, who is suffering today, his brilliance was not condemning people. One of the people that beat him, Bloody Sunday we know, one of the people that beat him years later came to his congressional office with his grandchild and begged in tears, begged him for his forgiveness. And what did he do? Did he do the kind of bravado and angry retaliation that we see evidence at the highest offices in our land now? No. He wept with that man, hugged him, and forgave him because all of us are people in development. All of us have made mistakes. May none of us ever be judged by the least of what we've done. This election is about heart and spirit and values and who can best ignite them in our country. Um, uh, uh, some people would say that. Uh, this, one, uh, this one says, since we don't know the things in life that may come, it may be that one day I'll no longer be anyone. And uh, that... Well, it actually pertains to what I'm about to ask you. Um, I'm uh, very concerned about the Trump administration's war on journalism. And uh, I'm really disturbed about what's happening to Julian Assange, who's being locked in solitary confinement and faces extradition to this country. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, as president, what are you going to do to defend this man who has done quite a bit to uh, inform us about what our government is doing in our name? Well, this is one legal case I don't know as much as clearly you do. Um, so I'm not going to comment on that because I just don't know all the facts in this case. I know if people have broken our laws, uh, that they should be held accountable, and if he has broken our laws, there should be due pro he should be afforded everything that people in my community often are not, <laughs> is fair trials, due process, uh, 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 and the like. And we have a country, as Brian Stevenson says, that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. So um, this uh, 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 individual, is, I, I, I'm going to make sure that we do justice by him. But I'm going to talk about the bigger question you had and my teasing of Cruz over there, which I hope you all tease as well. Um, <laughs> Look, there, the, 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 the charge of fake news right now that, that we hear our president make, other countries literally are imprisoning people now. We have an attack on journalism, making journalists less safe. We are hearing things that authoritarian and totalitarian governments say all the time, coming out of the mouths of, our, of people in our highest offices. This is a crisis in our country, and even equally challenging to me is the fact that, that, that the very strategies of, of the Russians, 
the, is this misinformation idea, is to try to make America get to the point where they don't know who to trust anymore, where objective facts aren't facts anymore. And, 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 and by the way, we all have to take some responsibility. We're not to blame, but, but all of us take responsibility because, God, we, we are creating a system of fractured media where what gets rewarded, and I saw the Star Ledger, my state's newspaper, now change where people are being compensated, if I have it correctly, and you can, you can fact check me instantly on this, by how many click-throughs they get on their stories. 20% of your salaries based on click-throughs. So what behavior is that incentivizing in these new corporate media structures? And, and so we have a, 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 a real challenge with news and information in our country that we need to take seriously now before it becomes even worse than it is. And, and, and I'm telling you right now, I worry because in the political context, what is that reward? If I were when Donald Trump is speaking, at the State of the Union address on, I think it's February 5th, if I were to yell out at him while he was talking, you lie, I might have my best fundraising quarter as a presidential candidate. And I make that statement based upon a little bit of evidence, which is when Obama had that done to him, that guy went out and had one of his best fundraising quarters. And we reward that behavior. One of my friends uh, is a great guy uh, named Van Jones. He's an amazing guy. I've known him since law school. And he was on a show with Newt Gingrich called Crossfire. And the two of them got to know each other as friends. Brene Brown says it's hard to hate up close, so pull people in. Now these guys were paid to sit together, but they're great, they're human beings, I should say. And they started talking and realizing they had so much in common. And so they decided that the last segment of their show was gonna be called Ceasefire. And they were gonna talk about the things they agree on. Well, guess what the producers did? They stopped it because they were saying ratings go down and you want to hand off to the next show with high ratings. All of us have to take responsibility for what is happening to ideals of truth and information because we are not as divided as our media wants us to be, to sound like we're being. I, I'll tell you this because I know 90% of Americans believe on common sense gun safety, but we can't pass laws. Let me give you another one. Obamacare, you poll Republicans, significant amounts against it. You take Obama's name off of it <laughs> and pull the individual policy pieces of Obamacare, people love it. We have become such a fractured society, tribalistic, where we're, we're benefiting some people, often many politicians who want us to be at war with ourselves. I don't buy into that. And so, sir, I, I'm gonna do everything I can, of course, for due process. The media plays a very important role. But this is in a larger context within our society where we have to start addressing the erosion of our institutions, the erosion of trusts, and the lurching we're doing towards sensationalism, towards half-truths, towards misinformation that is now polluting our, our, our public spheres and, and our most sacred spaces, which are that, that civic discourse that is essential uh, for a thriving democracy. So we're gonna try a couple quick questions. Quick questions. Yes, right. um, real quick. First week in office, do you repeal the Muslim ban? Yes. Yes. If that's what quick answers, yes. And a lot of other things, absolutely. Um, and touching again on immigration is the issue of detainers, which we have here in New Hampshire, which is when ICE asks local law enforcement to hold somebody until they can get there. Um, as president, would you end the use, would you prevent ICE from utilizing local law enforcement like yeah, that? The best way to look at future uh, actions is to look at past behavior. When I was mayor of the city of Newark, the 287G program, uh, we became vilified on Fox News for just saying no. And because you have your local police doing federal immigration law, you create lack of safety for your community because immigrant communities, a fear I talked, a toxic fear I talked about, now in the city of Newark, my local cops tell me this all the time, the immigrant communities they used to get cooperation from solving crimes, they don't want to talk to anybody within the police department because they're fear of being deported. And so uh, I'm a big, I, I will make America so much safer around immigration issues in this president because it, by him injecting fear into our society, it's making our communities less safe, it's violating our values, it's hurting our economy. This, Amer this president's making us poorer, less safe, all the while violating core American values that will end under my presidency. Questions? Hi, I'm Doris, grew up in Paramus. <laughs> And I'm very grateful for your candidacy. I'm hearing you speak from your heart. 
We here in uh, New Hampshire have a really strong immigrant rights network. Here in Concord, a uh, group of us went to Homestead many times. And right now, we're trying to get um, all of the candidates to go to the border to see the effect of the MPP remain in Mexico uh, ruling. And I'm wondering if you would consider doing that. So if you, if you want to know my core values, um, there's, a, there's a Bible verse about Matthew 25. When I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was poor uh, uh, or, or hungry, did you feed me? Um, this is my life, and, and so I don't talk about issues unless I often put myself out there. And, and so I've been to the border multiple times. Uh, an organization uh, a few months ago asked me to come down, go into Mexico, and help to escort women who were survivors of sexual violence and trauma who had been denied uh, asylum to maybe if they walked with a United States senator. And I went in and took the women together and walked across the bridge. Before that, I went into Mexico, but I didn't want any attention. I went late at night, around midnight. We got out of the car, we walked over the bridge. As soon as we got over the bridge, um, a, a, a great, uh, a great uh, Mexican official jumps out and says, demasiado peligroso, necesitas, necesitas regresar, you need to go back. It's too dangerous. I'm, I'm again, I, I don't know if you all noticed, I'm a big guy, former tight end, no, I'm joking. <laughs> But I turn around and go back, and then I want to see what, what the experience is of someone trying to cross the border. And, and they didn't wait till I got in the United States. They had people stationed on the bridge to stop me right there before I could even step into America. Remember, it is the law of our land that you should be able to present yourself for asylum. And he starts asking me for papers, and I'm doing, complying with his commands, but I'm also asking him a lot of questions. He seems to be a little frustrated by my questions, and finally he goes, well, who are you? And that's when I sometimes solve a problem when my testosterone kicks in, and I look at him indignantly, and I, I said, my name is Cory Booker, I'm a United States Senator. Uh, and he suddenly goes, well, you need to talk to the public relations people. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I happen to have uh, on my phone the head of the Customs and Border Protection who had represented things to me that, that I was seeing were not true. Because what I was seeing in that moment was that people, moms, with young children at night were being sent back into a town that this six foot three black guy from Jersey was told it was, too safe to, it was not safe enough for me to walk into. But yet these vulnerable citizens who are escaping trauma and, and challenges are being sent back into communities where now I know from my visits to Mexico where they're preyed upon. And so I, I, I will continue to go. I, I've gone to immigration detention centers to, to help a woman in Missouri who was not getting uh, um, um, access. She's a pregnant woman, but we felt was not getting uh, the kind of treatment and medical examinations that they need. I've gone to these private prisons that, that, over, that, are, that are immigrant detention facilities uh, down around the, uh, in Texas uh, to, to check in on the conditions of them. I've been in my own state, which has had a lot of controversial, controversy uh, uh, as, uh, as, as Cruz will, will tell you, uh, um, this is something that all of us Americans have to understand, that these things are being done in our name. And we are doing things that are violating people's human rights. And we're doing things that are turning our back that make me think about horrific chapters from our past, like the St. Louis. If you don't know the St. Louis, please look it up. It was a ship coming from Nazi Europe. It came to our shores seeking asylum, and our country turned it around. And many of those people in those ships died, uh, died in the Holocaust. And we said, and we say it a lot, never again. Well, one of my best moments as a human being, one of my best moments as, as, a, as an American was when I went, when the Muslim ban happened, I heard that what, we got a federal court order because I heard that the people who were being detained weren't given right to counsel, people from other countries. And so, you know, I, I jumped in a car, drove with my team up there, got a copy of the federal court order, and I was charging in to talk to the Customs and Border Patrol with my, it's basically Article One branch of government teaming up with Article Three branch of government to hold Article Two accountable. But then I walk in and I get stopped in my tracks because the whole concourse is full of hundreds and hundreds of Americans. I define hope as the active conviction that despair will never have the last word. Well, they weren't gonna let the last word of our country be anything as despairing as a violation of people's rights and being discriminated based on their religion. But what got me was every time a Muslim family would emerge, these are not American citizens, people would erupt in cheers like Abraham welcoming strangers in the desert. I saw 
Orthodox Jews, kippahs and tzitzahs hanging out, dancing and singing as Muslim families came into this country. Uh, uh, um, it was amazing. I go back to the Senate floor, and a guy named Joe Donnelly, who was then senator of Indiana, he and I had com latter conversations. He tells me, the same thing happened to me. I raced out to uh, Indianapolis airport, and as people came out of the gate, we were hugging them and cheering hundreds of people, except for Corey. There were no international flights. <laughs> we, we were just hugging people from Detroit. <laughs> I've done that, I will continue to do that, no matter what position I hold, no matter what title I have, as long as I'm an American, I will not preach our values more than I try to act on them in my personal life, my professional life, and everything that I do. All right, we're running out of time, so we'll end with one really quick question, yes. um, which is on reproductive rights. Uh, it's January, Roe v. Wade anniversary is this month. Um, if you were president, would you prioritize repealing the Hyde Amendment? Yes is a short answer, but it's not enough. So much more has to be done in the areas. This is an attack on, uh, on, on many Americans, uh, from transgender and non-binary Americans. It's an attack on, on women. And, and I want to be very specific as a guy, again, that, that, that uh, has been focused from the time I was in college on low-income communities. This is an attack on, on low-income Americans. And so it's just not enough. And, and I can go through my whole platform, but the one thing I want you to know is other presidents with serious national crises have elevated issues to, to, to the White House and created offices uh, on, on combating HIV and AIDS. Uh, um, I'm gonna create an office of reproductive freedom in the, in the White House uh, to make sure we coordinate between multiple agencies to make sure we protect uh, the sacrosanct uh, ability of a human being to control their own body, uh, have access to reproductive care. Uh, all of these things I think are fundamental rights for Americans and I will do everything I can as your president uh, to defend them. Thank you, everyone. Um, and we want to thank the senator for joining us today. And please, if you don't already, please follow the ACLU on Twitter. We will be having more of these. You'll have more opportunities to question your 2020 candidates. So thank you so much for coming.